Good afternoon uh, and good morning to our friends in Colombia. Uh, my name is Catherine O'Rourke. I'm director of the Transitional Justice Institute and we're delighted to co-host this event today with our friends in Christian Aid and AB Colombia uh, to discuss this important theme of truth and justice in Colombia. Uh, through the course of this uh, session, we plan to address a number of key themes. Um, uh, first and foremost, of course, the timeliness of this discussion as we approach the both the fifth anniversary of the peace agreement and also the publication of the Colombian Truth Commission report. Um, um, we'll also speak to the unique focus on corporate accountability that the report promises. Um, we'll address themes around how violence intersects with women's lives. Uh, and of course, all importantly, we will address this question of how the international community can play a positive role in current and forthcoming events in Colombia. Um, we are very fortunate to be joined by a distinguished uh, group of speakers who could address with great uh, expertise and experience um, all of these themes. I will, before we uh, formally commence with our first speaker, uh, I would just like to address a few housekeeping matters. Uh, first of all, this uh, the session is being uh, simultaneously translated uh, into Spanish. Um, if you would like to avail of the Spanish translation, you can uh, look to the bottom of your screen. There's an interpretation icon, um, and if you, uh, it's a globe. Uh, if you select that, that will allow you uh, access to simultaneous translation. Um, we will have time for Q&A towards the end of the session, so we encourage you to uh, drop your questions as they occur to you into the chat function, and we'll, we'll uh, monitor that through the course of the session. Um, and also we are recording this session uh, with the intention of uh, disseminating it more widely mm -hmm. afterwards. Um, so with that uh, housekeeping, um, it falls to me just to welcome uh, our, a warm welcome to our first speaker, uh, Mr. Eamon Gilmore. Uh, Eamon is uh, the European Union Special Representative for Human Rights uh, since March 2019, and he also serves as EU Special Envoy uh, for the Colombian Peace Process since October 2015. Uh, he was, of course, Ireland's former uh, Deputy Prime Minister as Tónisha and Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, Mr. Gilmore, um, a warm welcome, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, thank you, uh, Catherine. Thank you for the welcome. Uh, good afternoon to everyone in Europe. Good morning to everybody in the Americas. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today and uh, to join uh, such a prestigious uh, list of speakers. And uh, my particular thanks uh, to the organizers, AB Columbia, Christian Aid Ireland, and the Transitional Justice Institute of Ulster University for hosting today's very timely discussion. Transitional justice in Colombia is at a crucial point and the next few months will be extremely important. However, this comes in the midst of very challenging circumstances. Firstly, the global health crisis. And I would like to express my sincere condolences to all those who have lost loved ones during the COVID-19 pandemic. As in many countries, the pandemic has had a profound impact on Colombia and has aggravated inequality, poverty, and social exclusion. I recognize that for many, survival during the pandemic is now a greater preoccupation than issues related to the peace process. However, the implementation of the peace agreement in its entirety provides the best way of addressing many of the major challenges which Colombia faces today. This is because the agreement addressed the interlinked root causes of the conflict, and those causes mirror many of the same challenges that Colombia faces today, inequality, stigmatization, political participation, resources, land ownership, and drug trafficking. Over the past couple of weeks, Colombia has witnessed considerable unrest and violence. While this originated in the now withdrawn tax reform bill, it has now evolved into broader popular protests over many issues. I am deeply concerned and indeed shocked by the violence that we have seen, and I want to express my sincere sympathy to the families and the friends of the people who have been killed, as well as the hundreds that have been injured. These protests were not specifically about the peace process, but they clearly point to mistrust, disenfranchisement and anger. That frustration can only be dissolved through dialogue. In that vein, the peace agreement offers elements to strengthen participation and to enhance the protection of human rights. 
Such dialogue needs to involve all political actors and sectors of society to reduce tensions. This includes young people, those who have lost their loved ones and the families of the disappeared. I welcome the willingness of the government to uh, engage in dialogue with different sectors in strongly hopes that it will be inclusive and structured towards meaningful solutions. All actors should refrain from language that alienates, stigmatizes or provokes violence. Any violations or abuses of human rights committed should be investigated and perpetrators brought to justice. Any excessive use of force is unacceptable and indignation and outrage, while understandable, should never be accompanied by violence, vandalism or blockades. The right to peaceful protest is fundamental in any healthy democracy, as is trust between the population and those who protect it. And that trust can only be created through action. Against this complex background of massive protests and the ongoing health crisis, the implementation of the peace agreement is advancing. Implementation of any peace agreement is often more difficult than its negotiation in the first place and does not always move as swiftly as we would like. We've seen good progress in some areas, for example, in reincorporation and in the development of local development plans known as the PEDETS, but implementation of other areas needs to happen more quickly. The commitment of the parties is absolutely vital to the peace process. President Duque and his administration have consistently reiterated to me his commitment to the implementation of the peace agreement. So too has the FARC leadership and their recent response to the contents of Auto 019 from the, from the HEP, fully recognizing their collective role in kidnapping during the conflict is a very important step forward for victims and for truth and reconciliation. Despite the events of the past couple of weeks, the Colombian peace process is seen as a success internationally, a good news story and a model for other peace agreements. And this is why the UN Security Council continues to closely track the implementation of the agreement. The consistent attention of the UN Security Council has played a very valuable role in sustaining the Colombian peace process. Indeed, the support and solidarity of the international community has been consistent throughout the peace process. The United Nations continues to play that crucial role through the work of the UN agencies and the UN verification mission under the guidance of UN Special Representative Carlos Ruiz. This has been fundamental in monitoring the compliance of the parties to the commitments undertaken in the agreement. And that work is again underpinned by support from the UN Security Council. The European Union has been involved in peace building in Colombia for well over two decades. This is because we know from our own experience in Europe how difficult peace building is. The EU itself was born as a peace project. And earlier this week on the 9th of May, we celebrated Europe Day. The opening words of the Schumann Declaration make very clear the challenge Europe faced then and that Colombia faces now. Peace cannot be safeguarded without the making of creative efforts proportionate to the dangers which threaten it. That is why the European Union has worked with civil society and local communities in Colombia, supporting peace from the ground up through the Peace Laboratories project and its successive programs. It is largely due to this work that the EU was named as a supporting actor in three areas in the final peace agreement, rural development, reincorporation of former FARC combatants into civilian life, and the establishment of a special investigation unit in the Prosecutor General's office. And we established an EU trust fund with 127 million euros in 2016 to support the implementation of the agreement. Civil society has and continues to play a central role in peace building in Colombia. And this is crucial for implementation of the agreement to be truly successful. The killings of social leaders, human rights defenders and ex-combatants since the agreement was signed remains one of my biggest concerns. The pandemic has exposed even further the prevailing insecurity in some regions of the country. As with the current protests, dialogue and concrete practical solutions are the only way to address such a serious and complex situation. The National Commission for Security Guarantees has to be utilized to its maximum potential to reach such solutions. At the heart of the Colombian Peace Agreement is restoration, reparation, reconciliation and reconstruction. Transitional justice cannot be about retribution or recrimination. And I recognize that that can be difficult for many. 
Victims must always be at the heart of the search for truth and justice. I believe that the Colombian transitional justice system is designed exactly for that purpose. We have seen much progress in recent months and incredible leadership by the three heads of the different institutions. As the report by the Truth Commission will be published later this year, I want to mention in particular the moral courage and dignity of Father Francisco de Rue. His leadership and dedication has been absolutely critical since the Commission started its work just a couple of years ago. His belief that the truth must be a public good, a right and an inescapable duty when it comes to explaining why life and dignity were destroyed in thousands of massacres, forced disappearances, kidnappings, extrajudicial killings and many other crimes. This is what drives the work of the Commission. In addition to supporting the work of the other transitional ju justice institutions, the EU is very proud to support the work of the Truth Commission. And we are doing that in concrete ways, including through a project worth 4.5 million euros, which is currently by, being implemented uh, by uh, Red Pro de, de Paz. That project seeks to strengthen the Commission's work in rural areas of the country where so-called truth houses have been established. It also seeks to promote and guarantee the broadest possible participation of victims and perpetrators, to facilitate the participation of different ethnic groups and to strengthen communication around the work of the Commission. The Truth Commission's work is not just to produce a final report. It is also to cultivate an inclusive social dialogue around ownership of the truth and to persuade all Colombians, even those who are skeptical or indifferent, how critical the truth is to peace building and to breaking the cycle of conflict in the country. That is a painful process. Testimonies are deeply personal stories and experiences of suffering and tragedy. To gather these stories, we have seen how the Truth Commission has had to reinvent itself during the pandemic. Instead of public hearings and meetings with victims, there have been live streamed conversations, podcasts, TV shows and concerts and countless private conversations. Despite this, there have been some incredibly powerful moments. For example, with landmine victims, family members of police officers who were victims of enforced disappearances and public requests for forgiveness by former guerrilla and paramilitary leaders. The contribution of the military and police to the Truth Commission has also been an important step forward and other actors must do the same. So that as Father Deru said at the inauguration of the commission, by exposing the complexity of barbarism and horror, instead of deepening retaliation and revenge among us, an understanding of ourselves in the sincerity of our responsibilities and our differences is achieved and opens us to the collective construction that future generations of Colombia deserve. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to today's meeting. Thank you so much, Mr. Gilmore. Um, uh, thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, we'll move now to our next speaker, who's uh, uh, Pablo de Grief. Uh, Pablo is a um, longtime friend of the TJI, so it's been very nice to, to reconnect with him through this event. Um, indeed, we were uh, contacted long before his, uh, his um, uh, recent role as uh, the first UN Special Rapporteur on Truth, Justice, Reparations and Guarantees of Non-Recurrence. Um, so, and Pablo is also, of course, from Colombia. Uh, Pablo is currently appointed at the NYU, um, but he's going to speak more broadly to um, the significance of uh, transitional justice and truth and justice in Colombia. Um, Pablo, thank you very much. On the contrary, thank you, Catherine, and uh, thanks to AB Colombia and uh, to Christian Aid for this wonderful initiative. And of course, I am honored uh, to share the stage, as it were, with uh, my distinguished uh, co-panelists. I would like to start by making two preliminary points that may not be directly on topic, but that I still think uh, are relevant. Uh, one point is global and one point is local, and I will start with the local point. And that is, of course, in reference to the violence and the disturbances that we have seen uh, uh, lately. And uh, like uh, Mr. Gilmore, I, of course, want to offer condolences to people who have suffered, uh, family members. 
I would also like to insist uh, on uh, the importance of uh, human rights, particularly in moments uh, like uh, this. Uh, I think that the respect for freedom of association and freedom of expression is absolutely critical. Uh, the limited use of force is absolutely an essential obligation of the state. Uh, uh, citizens, of course, also stand under obligations uh, to respect uh, life and uh, property. And I think uh, this, some of the scenes that we have seen uh, lately, I consider to be both uh, unconstructive and in many ways totally contrary to the spirit of the process that the country was supposed to be embarked upon. The second point uh, is uh, global, and uh, of course, I will not uh, uh, linger on it, uh, but I do want to point out uh, that the uh, current uh, uh, moment uh, is one in which, in my mind, uh, can be characterized as an approximation to a sort of systemic uh, breakdown provoked by the pandemic, but of course not caused solely by it. And I think that this is systemic breakdown because different systems, for example, rating agencies are working on their own tracks, regardless of what is happening around us to the point that, for example, facilities that have been established by the G20 in order to uh, ease the economic worries of some countries whose debt is raising very, very rapidly, have been undermined by the threat by credit rating agencies that the countries' credits will go down. So this is uh, what is happening in Colombia, I think, is uh, something that could happen in many, many countries that the international community, I don't think, has fully internalized uh, the gravity and the urgency of uh, the situation. I remember after the Euro crisis, uh, Mario Draghi, then president of the European Central Bank, uh, saying, we will do whatever it takes to save the euro. And that message was absolutely essential at that point. I think that we are in a period in which central banks in wealthy countries are basically acting on that message. We will do whatever it takes to sustain our economies. But unfortunately, poorer countries do not have uh, the same uh, opportunity. And I think that the international community should uh, uh, react uh, to a crisis that in the end uh, will not be contained uh, uh, by national borders. And I think that what uh, is happening in Colombia right now should be a warning sign of what could happen if the international community is not more aggressive in its dealings with the economic secondary effects of the pandemic. But those are preliminary points. Uh, <coughs> then let me make a few remarks about um, the transitional justice process in Colombia and finally get to the question that was posed in the title of the meeting, why is truth and justice important in Colombia? And I was invited to make these reflections from a comparative perspective. So the first point that one can make from a comparative perspective is that I think that it is important for us to internalize the lesson that has been learned again and again the transitional processes are harder than we thought at first. The implementation of the measures take longer, they take more money, they are never as complete, thorough and sustainable as we think at first. They always stand in need of being complemented by other measures. 
uh, transitional justice does not exhaust uh, the reform agenda of uh, countries in uh, transitions. Uh, and uh, I think that it is very important for all of us uh, to internalize the idea that truth and justice on their own, especially in the short run, do not produce social reconciliation. That truth and justice, in fact, are not only hard to achieve, but that they send a difficult message messages that need to be internalized and processed through uh, accompanying measures uh, as well. My impression, again, from a comparative perspective, is uh, that uh, the institutions of the Sistema Integral that was established in Colombia are functioning quite well, in fact. Of course, uh, they have taken time, but this is part of the first point uh, that I was making. These processes always take longer than uh, one thought. But uh, I think uh, that uh, it is important to recognize that Colombia made a huge commitment, uh, for example, establishing the HEP, and that in a fairly short period of time, in a three-year period, for an institution that was starting from scratch, I think it is functioning quite well. The Truth Commission is also doing its work under particularly difficult uh, circumstances. Uh, so despite the fact that they have taken their time and that surely they will never make everyone happy, that is part of the territory, part of the nature of these efforts and these institutions. Now, taking a broader perspective concerning the implementation of the accord and not just the establishment of the HEP, the Truth Commission and the uh, unit for the search of the disappeared, I think we still have a long way to go. I will not linger on the security issues that were present in the country even before the demonstrations started. But the killing of almost 300 social leaders does not speak very well about the commitment to the process and is something that the government is going to have to take very, very seriously. That same ambivalence towards uh, the comprehensive implementation of the process is also shown from my perspective in the lack of progress on points uh, one and two of uh, the accord. A rural reform uh, in a country with uh, shameful patterns of distribution of wealth, including land, is not having an easier time than it has had in the past, but this is a part of the accord and it is absolutely essential to make progress on it. The second point of the accord on political participation cannot be said to be the object of a more serious commitment either. Uh, sadly, this would have been extraordinarily helpful in channeling perfectly justified social discontent in the recent weeks, if more progress had been made in the implementation of measures having to do with social participation, with the transparency, with more deliberation, and uh, with the protection of uh, the rights of peaceful political activity. And I think uh, that we would not be where we are if more progress had been made in the comprehensive implementation of the accord. Now, finally, because I do not want to take much more time, let me take, uh, let me turn to the question of why truth and justice uh, are important in Colombia. I have argued many times in the past, and I did uh, when I was a special rapporteur, that for all its limitations, uh, transitional justice can make uh, four very important contributions. 
when it is implemented comprehensively as a coherent policy. Transitional justice can contribute to recognizing victims, not just uh, as victims, but importantly as rights holders. Transitional justice can make a contribution to promoting civic trust and particularly trust on the institutions of the state. More remotely, but similarly importantly, transitional justice can make a contribution to strengthening the rule of law, and it can make a contribution to processes of social integration. Perhaps a very simple way of uh, uh, recollecting these four points is to say that transitional justice processes help to make victims visible. And I think that this is important in a country like Colombia, where for so long elites considered the conflict to be a victimless conflict, basically a threat to the economic infrastructure of the country, but the victims were nowhere to be seen. That has changed, and I think that it has changed uh, irretrievably. And that is a very, very good thing. There is no going back from that. Victims have gained a place in the public sphere that, of course, they deserve and that the country needs in order <coughs> to be able to say that it is involved in the establishment of a shared political process. Now, with respect to the role of the international community at this juncture, I think that it is very important for the international community to accompany and to pressure when necessary for the full compliance with the agreement, including points one and two, which uh, as I mentioned, uh, are not doing that great. I think it is important for the international community to be there for the long haul, because as I said, the temporal horizons of transitional justice are much longer than we anticipated. It is very important for the international community to think uh, that uh, what happens outside of Bogota is sometimes even more important than what happens in Bogota. The Truth Commission, for example, is not just the plenary, and I share Mr. Gilmore's absolute unrestricted respect for Father de Roux and his fellow commissioners. But there are structures that the Truth Commission has established outside Bogota that are just as important and have a potential for unleashing positive regional conversations that need to be supported. The international community tends to be, for reasons that can be understood, uh, capital-centered. And finally, and going back to the point that transitional justice always needs to be accompanied by other processes, I think that it is crucial for the international community to make itself present with respect to those other processes. And I have in mind, for example, very difficult topics that were not discussed in the agreement, but that are absolutely critical for the future of the country, including security sector reform, the strengthening of oversight mechanisms and courts, both of which in my mind have been weakened over time and without which the country will not be able to survive as a viable democracy. These are again difficult topics that require a separate conversation, but the international community can provide both the incentives and the forums to engage in conversations on which a great deal hinges, including, without exaggeration, in my opinion, the future of the accord itself. As a Colombian, of course, I am extremely grateful for the role that the international community has played thus far. But I think that we are in many ways just at the beginning 
and some of the topics that are left are precisely the ones where the greatest assistance will be necessary. So I will finish here and thank you very much once again for this invitation. Thank you so much, Pablo. Thank you for um, those important contributions. I think I've um, very effectively you know, made sure that this discussion is very much grounded in, in what is happening uh, today, both in Colombia and also in terms of the broader uh, global financial and, and uh, global health context. So thank you very much. Um, it was a sobering input um, about the challenges ahead. Um, and indeed, both Mr. Gilmore and, and Pablo addressed uh, very importantly there the potential role of the international community. and. I should of course, of course note that um, that's an, an important motivator for this discussion is Ireland's current membership on the United Nations Security Council, um, the ongoing role of the Security Council in terms of a verification mission in Colombia, um, and the potential to keep um, Pablo's insights about the importance of human rights, security sector reform, and the rule of law um, to all of the uh, international support to the Colombian process. Um, so with that, we're going to change uh, the thematic focus uh, just to slightly uh, to address this, one of the unique components of the Colombian transitional justice process, which is its provision for, around corporate accountability. And we are very fortunate to be joined today um, by really the uh, leading experts in this sort of global and comparative field of, of how transitional justice um, can uh, support uh, economic accountability and accountability around economic violations. Um, so we're joined by Professor Lee Payne, who's a professor of sociology at the University of Oxford, and uh, her uh, a co colleague, uh, Laura Bernal Bermudez, who's an assistant professor at the Faculty of Law at the Pontifica Universidad Javeriana in, in Bogota. Um, and uh, Laura is also an affiliated researcher at the Latin American Center at the University of Oxford. Um, Lee and Laura are co-authors with Gabrielle Pereira on a new book on transitional justice and corporate accountability from below. Um, uh, so we're very pleased to be able to invite your contributions that can speak to both this international experience and, and also the Colombian experience. Um, so Lee and Laura, um, thank you and welcome. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, and I want to thank the organizers and also for and fellow panelists and the participants for creating this space, this opportunity to express our shared uh, commitment to human rights and also our solidarity with the events that are transpiring in Colombia. Um, you can all see my screen. Is it? You're not seeing the screen, are you? Okay, good. Let me make it full screen and slideshow. <clears throat> the, the question that we were invited to speak about um, in this presentation is uh, how we can think about the role of truth commissions in the guarantee of non-repetition for economic actors engaged in crimes against humanity. And I'm going to use two different approaches to conceptual frameworks for this uh, discussion. First, deterrence theory, applying deterrence theory and thinking about how can truth commissions uh, and transitional justice in general raise the costs of committing human rights violations for economic actors. And deterrence theory would argue that uh, creating high costs associated with financial, legal, or reputational uh, events would be the way to attach some high sanctions to these kinds of human rights uh, behaviors and therefore would reduce the likelihood that they would be committed. Um, in terms of truth commissions, we can think about how certainly there would be a reputational cost as, as Pablo was just speaking about uh, to, to make visible the wrongdoing in financial and legal terms, the recommendations that come out of truth, truth commissions, uh, if implemented, could also raise those costs and therefore the perception of costly sanctions applied to these uh, behaviors. A truth commission approach would look primarily at that uh, reputational effect, the idea of uh, making uh, visible to promote the knowledge and acknowledgement of wrongdoing to the point where even that these kinds of acts of committing uh, gross violations of human rights become unthinkable to change the narrative. 
to make that, that visible and audible through truth commissions. And what I'd like to do in, in my part of the presentation is, is talk a little bit about what comes out of our tracking of corporate accountability and transitional justice to see the degree to which uh, truth commissions in particular, but transitional justice in general has achieved this threshold of deterrence and uh, acknowledge, knowledge and acknowledgement of wrongdoing by economic actors. I can't go into the trials data. As you can see, uh, we, we covered a, a wide swath of accountability mechaniz mechanisms, but what I wanna say is that every type of court that we looked at, uh, from the historic co courts to the, um, to the contemporary domestic courts, we see some forms of costly um, sanctions attached to crimes against humanity carried out um, with the involvement of economic actors. But what we also see is that there have been ways in each one of these levels of courts for corporate actors to veto accountability mechanisms. Uh, impunity prevails. We have very few cases in the end. Um, and I can't go into detail, but we can come back and talk about this in, um, in the Q&A, if you like. What I'd like to focus on, if I can change the slide, what I'd like to focus on is the um, Truth Commission findings, since that's what we were asked to discuss here. On the positive or what we could say the guarantees of non-repetition side, we can show with our, uh, with our database that over half of all the Truth Commission's final reports in the world not only identify corporate complicity in human rights violations in, in armed conflicts and authoritarian regimes, but name companies. We found over 300 companies that are named uh, for alleged complicity in blood crimes, uh, in, in crimes against humanity. And this occurred without specific mandates in the truth commissions, that it, it occurred from the participation of victims and survivors in the testimonies of these truth commissions that made it into the final reports. Um, but what we also have to uh, acknowledge is that this hasn't meant necessarily that high reputational or other types of costs, knowledge and acknowledgement have come out of these truth commission reports. Uh, very, these truths about economic actors and uh, alleged involvement in crimes against humanity are not known. The reporting, the truths in the truth commissions are not known, not even by experts in transitional justice. It took digging into these uh, truth commission files by our team of researchers to reveal these truths. Uh, but we also found very few recommendations and the recommendations that we did find in these Truth Commission reports are often left in vague terms of implementing more human rights standards, voluntary reparation on the part of economic actors, and we found only three recommendations for further judicial investigation into these crimes. Again, only three commissions that, that recommended uh, further judicial investigation into economic actors' involvement in these crimes. We do see some pretty promising and innovative uh, new directions for truth commissions. And I won't go into these again now, but I would put the Columbia's Commission for Clarification of Truth, uh, Coexistence and Non-Repetition in this group of sort of promising and innovative uh, approaches to economic actors involvement in, uh, in, in crimes against humanity. Um, what I want to go to now is just to say, how can we uh, strengthen the role that truth commissions and other forms of transitional justice can play in guaranteeing non-repetition of economic actors' engagement in crimes against humanity? We use in our, uh, and, our and I'm making a shameless <laughs> um, a advertisement for our book, we use in our book uh, the framework of Archimedes' lever. Uh, and if you remember, Archimedes said, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it and I can move the world. This, uh, what, the way we adapt it is to think about how even weak actors in the global south 
uh, with the right tools and the specific placement of the fulcrum can lift the heavy weight of the world. So that heavy weight is corporate accountability. This is held down by these powerful, the powerful veto uh, uh, of economic actors. But what we see is mobilizing victims, survivors, and the human rights community to support the demand for accountability in truth commissions through not only allowing the testimony, hearing the testimony, and making the testimony part of the truth commission reports can be part of this set of tools, the right tools, the lev lever for making visible and making audible these claims against economic actors for their involvement in gross violations of human rights. This is important role for the institutional innovators, those staff in the truth commissions, the commissioners themselves to make, to translate these demands into visible and audible uh, claims by victims and survivors of violations. But what has acted as a real uh, problem in terms of advancing these cases is the fulcrum or the political context in which these truth commissions are uh, transpiring, what Mr. Gilmore referred to as challenging circumstances, uh, sometimes very shocking circumstances uh, in which the political context uh, is, is not favorable to, for human rights, a respect for human rights and accountability for economic actors. And what we would, uh, how I would end this comment is to pick up on what um, Pablo was talking about is the role international actors like those of us in this Zoom room can play in putting pressure and being engaged in, in making more visible and more audible these claims from below, uh, from global, uh, from the local actors in the global South to hold economic actors accountable for their involvement in these human rights violations. And now I'll turn it over to Laura to speak specifically about the Colombia context. Thank you, Lee. Um, so I would like to talk to you uh, about the, the Colombian context in terms of corporate complicity and corporate accountability. Um, I think, it's going backwards. <laughs> okay, so um, basically we went from not knowing about this phenomenon or at least knowing about it through case studies or isolated cases to um, then uh, with the justice and peace process. And Lee, I think it, you need to go back one, <laughs> one slide. Yeah, to the justice and peace process where we, um, as a team, coded uh, 35 judicial actions issued by the justice and peace chambers between 2011 and 2015. And we found uh, mentions of over 400 economic actors involved in different types of violations, including multinational companies, national domestic companies, business people, and business associations. And 98% of these mentions refer to domestic uh, actors, which is important because sometimes in the more international discussions around the regulation of business behavior tends to focus on multinational companies and not what's going on with the more domestic and not uh, legal entities, uh, companies in, in these types of abuses. Um, one of our interests was to track how not only the phenomenon, but also understand in terms of accountability, what has happened in Colombia. And as you see uh, from the justice and peace process, uh, the, the magistrates were not um, did not have a mandate to investigate or to put on trial economic actors, but because of the testimonies of the um, or the confessions of the paramilitaries, uh, they actually created, they were innov innovators in terms of creating the system where if they had enough evidence to ask the prosecutor's office to further investigate the cases. Uh, including these economic actors and other third parties to the conflict, they would. But um, as you see here in this slide, in 69% of those 400 mentions, 69% of the cases, there were no orders to investigate. So that shows the difficulty in terms of evidence in these types of cases. Uh, and then from those only 28% of those cases have orders uh, to the prosecutors 
but they remain in preliminary, preliminary investigations and we have no trials, so very little advancement of these cases. And then only 3% of these cases have the order uh, to investigate and have reached the trial stage and very few have actually uh, ended with convictions. So as you see, um, in terms of accountability, we have, you know, we, we have some advancement, we have some processes that have been developed, uh, but very slow uh, process to, to reach uh, convictions or accountability in the end. Okay. Um, in terms of distribution of the cases in the territory, as you see, um, these cases from the paramilitary AUC group um, are mainly focused in the north of the country. And I sh we show this, this map just to say not only what we already found, find out or we've already found out, but also everything that still needs to come out needs to be acknowledged in terms of what happened in the south and what happened uh, with the FARC guerrilla and complete this picture because it's still very much um, only one side of the of the of the truth. Um, we also have some very recent data about the the with the prosecutor's office in terms of investigations of business uh, actors and as you see you know and that was very interesting to hear they have over they have 600 investigations currently um, against uh, business actors for their involvement in the conflict but as you see 600 are in preliminary investigations uh, half of them are active half of them inactive so showing again the difficulties of the the process and the evidence uh, and then only 10 have reached the trial stage and 15 of these cases have had a ruling and this is until March 2021. Um, and so where we are right now with the special jurisdiction for peace and the truth commission is very special as Lee said in terms of two institutions that had a mandate originally uh, to investigate these cases um, it, the, the narrative of the conflict was no longer one or is no longer one where it's only armed actors facing each other, but other, also involving other actors in society um, with a special jurisdiction for peace after the decision of the Constitutional Court. Basically, um, it, can, it can only investigate cases of business people that have voluntarily requested to be uh, put on trial by the HEP. Uh, until 2019, we had um, around 657 third parties, which included not only business people, but other third parties to the conflict, request a, being a part of the, of the process in the HEP. A, but according to, a, to an investigation of the C, a, La Silla Vacía, a, basically only 13 out of those a, a third parties are business people, a, which is as you see, 2%, very few, and there are a, a lot of preoccupation because we only see a business people coming to the HEP when the investigations in the prosecutors in the ordinary jurisdiction are advancing. That's the only incentive. And so those actors that have historically eluded justice are not a, coming forth, and we still have that gap in terms of accountability. The Truth Commission, a, has had the mandate from the beginning and um, different from what has happened in other countries. It started, it didn't uh, stumble <laughs> into corporate complicity through the testimony of victims, but it, uh, they, there was actually a really interesting discussion from the beginning with different stakeholders to think about how to bring, how to involve business, the business sector in the discussions and in the conversations. And there was a methodology designed from the beginning to investigate this. And of course, we're all looking forward to reading the report, which uh, will include the issue, uh, the issue. And just to end, I wanted to sort of uh, think about this Archimedes Lever uh, model and the guarantees of non-repetition and what is going on in Colombia. So basically we see civil society uh, pushing and mobilizing for accountability. And that is why we've gone from no, uh, no visibility of the issue to a uh, truth commission and the special jurisdiction for peace with an original mandate to investigate these cases. But we also see, as Pablo was saying, uh, increased violence against social 
leaders and, and uh, human rights defenders. And that obviously uh, is, is a problem for, for mobilization. We also see increased veto power from economic actors. Uh, and uh, we might even see it as a sort of backlash for the, the relative success that the victims have had in the courts with convictions of economic actors. Um, and also obviously the, the advancement of this, of this issue into the actual design of the current mechanisms, but there is increased veto uh, power, a, a context that has moved to the negative, to be negative to uh, accountability efforts, difficulties in implement, implementing the, the agreement and um, obviously a, a business elite very close to high levels of government that, that uh, don't facilitate uh, these types of, of processes. And I would like to end just by saying the importance in this situation, in this context right now in Colombia that we are all aware and we've been discussing this morning, the importance of the international pressure and how it is key to support the efforts of victims and their advocates and the institutional innovators in the courts and in the truth commissions trying to advance these cases. Uh, we have evidence in Colombia of cases where the participation of INGOs, of the Inter-American System of Human Rights, and even of foreign governments have facilitated cases in that, you know, in that difficult from 600 to 10, 15 uh, convictions, facilitating that movement just by being, uh, you know, applying pressure and, and being aware of these processes and, and tracking them and supporting the work of victims and of their advocates. So I would like to end there just to say how important international pressure is in Colombia right now. Thank you so much, Lee and Laura. Um, that was a, a really fascinating contribution. I mean, to, to hear that um, really very stark uh, empirical data from Colombia about uh, the scale of violations and the, the small number of um, uh, legal proceedings to date, um, and also that I think to put it in that important global context around um, the role of civil society in um, our communities lever, um, and of course the potential role of, of, of the international community in, in amplifying those demands. Um, so I think that's a nice opportunity then to, to, to move to our next speaker, um, who will speak from civil society in Colombia, um, <coughs> excuse me, and also to change our thematic focus uh, just a little to the question of um, intersectionality and conflict related um, sexual violence against women in, in the Colombian conflict and how transitional justice processes can and will um, respond to that. Um, so we're very fortunate to be joined by Maria Adelaida Palacio Puerta from uh, Sismo Mujer. Uh, she's a lawyer specializing in education for citizenship and a lecturer in human rights. Um, she served, she formerly served as undersecretary uh, of the government of Bogota, coordinator of the legal area of uh, Corporacion Humanas and a uh, consultant for the National Women's Network, IOM and USAID. Uh, currently, she works as manager of Sismo Mujer, uh, which is a partner of Christian Aid Ireland. Uh, Maria will speak in Spanish, so just a reminder to all of you who would like to access the translation that you can, um, if you look to the bottom of your Zoom screen, um, on the right hand side you'll see a globe uh, uh, icon with the word interpretation and that'll allow you to access the simultaneous uh, English translation. So Maria, um, thank you and welcome, we look forward to hearing from you. Hola, Hi, thank you very much. First of all, I want to apologize um, that I was a little bit, um, that the sound of my quality might not be great because I'm very close to where the demonstrations are taking place. So you might hear the drums and the shouts from the, the street. Um, and also to say that this, uh, the demonstration uh, is just that the response of the state to these demonstrations is entirely um, inadequate. And we must say that in the context of the implementation of the peace agreement, the attitude that the government has shown to these demonstrations is very similar to what it has been doing in the um, in the implementation of the peace agreement, which is not respect the agreements and not respect the voice of the, the demonstrators at all, um, but to engage in violation of human rights. 
Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk today in this context about the vulnerability of women um, and of trans um, intersectionality in the in the context of the failure to implement the the peace agreements. We are an organization that defends women's um, and LGBTQI rights. And we're going to talk what we have understood and what we have um, documented um, in our work with women victims of sexual violence and violation of their rights. This is the subject matter that I'm going to um, talk about. So I want to divide my presentation into three. The first, I am representing the women's movement in this attempt to visualize, to raise the profile of the violation of women's rights or the sexual violence against women in the context of the conflict. And then, second, I'm going to speak of the voices of women who've been victims of sexual violence. And then I'm going to end with um, talking about some of the challenges that, that remain or some of the challenges that face us in finding truth and um, reparation, in particular or in general, threats or um, challenges facing the legal system um, in relation to this question. So, first of all, um, women, it is not new that women are victims of sexual violence in the mark of the conflict in Colombia. This has been occurring forever, for ages. 2005, there was an agreement between the government and the paramilitary um, organizations, uh, which was called the Justice and Peace Process. And some of the um, decisions, some of the sentences that were handed down by the courts in the context of the Justice and Peace Process um, were explicitly on sexual violence carried out um, in the mark of the of the conflict. It was quite apparent from the testimony that was provided that the use of sexual violence was a systematic tool of war used by the paramilitary organizations. But between, these, um, the, between the beginning of the justice and peace process and the first sentence that was handed down for sexual violence in the context of the, of the conflict, 10 years passed. Justice, the wheels of justice moved very, very slowly. This lesson was learnt, and in the peace process with the, the negotiation with the FARC, um, women's movements insisted that sexual violence should be included in the agreement. It was a late add-on in the negotiation with the, with the paramilitaries, and so it was a, a clear conclusion of the women's movement that it should be included in the peace process with the, the negotiation with the FARC. Um, we argued that victims, that female victims should be in the center of the process. They shouldn't be marginal to, to the agreement, but they should be recognized as being central victims of the conflict. We felt that it was, as I say, extremely important that women were not seen as peripheral to the conflict, but as a, a central target of the armed groups. There are 122 gender um, measures within the peace agreement in recognition of this work that the the women's movement did um, they're not being implemented properly but at least in the the letter of the peace agreement we did we did we were successful in getting a perspective a gender perspective and recognition of gender-based violence um, against women in the context of violence recognized within the within the agreement um, also, the work that we have done that the women's movement has advanced is also long rooted. We've got a long history of having been working on these issues, insisting on these issues. In terms of the um, integrated truth, justice and reconciliation process, our work on women, um, we are waiting within the context of the transitional justice process that the group on women on violence against women produces report. We're still waiting for the report to be produced. One of the most serious obstacles faced by women in this context is that they have been, and that has helped to silence them for many, many years, is the sense of guilt that is imposed on women. Women feel guilty if they're victims of sexual violence. And that has been a big barrier to achieving justice. 
there is an accusation that is generally accepted by our machista society that women make up stories of sexual violence. The experience of women who seek to um, speak out and to seek justice makes it clear that they are marginalized and silenced by these social aspects and these cultural aspects. And the guilt that they have felt um, traditionally as a part of the culture is not handed over to the victims. It should be that this, there should be a transformation so that the guilt that they feel for being victims is actually felt by the people who have victimized them. It's a long process. Um, it's also important to recognize that society recognizes that sexual violence was carried out for many reasons. It was a way in which the armed groups, armed actors, sought to control the societies that they were operating in, control the communities. It's particularly apparent or, or eloquent in the testimonies of the, of the women that they have been used in order to assert the power of the armed groups. In many scenarios in Colombia, um, uh, children are expected or ex grown up, uh, grow up expecting to be converted into victims of, of violence in the areas of, of conflict. The presence of armed men um, taken alongside the absence of the state is dangerous to women, is dangerous to girls. This is one of the principal conclusions that the, that the testimonies that we have taken make very, very clear and particularly vulnerable are indigenous and Afro-descendant women. The Afro women have been very, have been clear that the violence which they have been subjected to by armed groups is a repetition, a continuation of a cycle of violence that they have been victims of since the early days of the existence of their presence in the country. And that the role of the state has done absolutely nothing to counter these um, these actions. So the women, black and um, indigenous women, have brought their ancestral knowledge, their ancestral understanding of gender-based violence to the way that they experience the violence that has been imposed on them during the more recent conflicts. And this historical experience of um, of, of gender-based violence is also um, must be understood as a part of the, the way in which women experience, have experienced the sexual violence that they have been victims of. And this is why it is so important for these communities that non-repetition is emphasized, because it's not just the recent conflict, it's the historical experience that needs to be repaired. I think it's very important that society um, takes, uh, understands the prevalence of gender-based violence, of, of sexual violence. The society, our society needs to recognize it and recognize that many of the practices are rooted, that these practices are rooted in the patriarchal, patriarchal system that characterizes Colombian society. And this is why we emphasize a particular um, importance of a treatment of, um, of the reckon, a treatment of violence that recognizes the gendered aspects of violence against women carried out in the context of the, the conflict. First, the report on, on violence against women should explicitly take note of the stories told by the women in order to ensure that its conclusions reflect the lived and historical realities of women. Second, the report should identify patterns that are not so much quantitative patterns, but qualitative. What kind of actions of violence have women been victims of that demonstrates that, that takes note of how long these practices have been, have, been, have been carried out and that recognize the similarity between modern expressions and past expressions of gender-based of gender violence, violence against women. Uh, 
and it's important that that the standards that are applied within the process are um, directed towards integral reparation for the women who have been victims of, of sexual violence in the uh, in the context of the conflict. So the attempts to uncover the truth must be rooted, as we say, in these historical realities and actually listen to the voice of the women who have been victims of sexual violence. We are very concerned that the regime is not interested. We don't know who is behind, who is responsible for um, the response to um, sexual violence against, against women in the context. The authorities are entirely unserious in their response to this question. And it's, so it's important that with, there is an understanding that the Truth Commission helps to clarify the way in which um, um, strategies of the use of sexual violence against women operates to the benefit of their interests, of the interests of the armed actors, the way they use sexual violence to advance their aims. Um, and it also is important to recognize with a gender perspective that sexual violence is also institutionalized violence, that the institutions also operate in ways which are anti-women and violatory and violate the rights of women and the bodies of women. So that all Colombians, men and women, become aware as a result of this process of the, um, the patterns of violence against women and the vulnerability that women face in the way in which, um, according to the, or in the, the, the way in which society is currently organized. And finally, I want to stress that we insist that the special jurisdiction for peace should decide um, should name a public prosecutor, a national level public prosecutor specialized in violence against women. Obviously, this should be a woman. The HEP doesn't have that at the moment, and it's very important that they do have a specialist um, prosecutor to deal with violence against women. This is a principal demand that we're making. At the moment, there is not an adequate um, reparation model for women who've been victims of sexual and, and, uh, and violence within the, the, within the context, and it's absolutely vital that one should be established. Thank you so much, um, Maria. Thank you for that powerful contribution. Um, it's so important to hear the voices of civil society in, in Colombia in our discussion today. Um, I'm going to move to just a, to a short contribution from our colleague Louise uh, Winstanley from AB Columbia. Um, just before Louise um, commences her comments, can I encourage, invite you all, please, to do put your questions, um, questions and comments into the through the chat function. You can put them in writing, and uh, we'll have an opportunity then to spend the last um, uh, element of the section of the event to to respond to those. So please do take the time while Louise is talking to to formulate your questions and to share them with us through the chat function. Um, um, so, and uh, to, to wrap our contributions today, uh, Louise Winstanley uh, from AB Columbia. Uh, Louise. Thank you so much, Catherine. Okay, so um, as with the other speakers who have mentioned, um, our thoughts are very much with um, Columbia at the moment in terms of what's happening. Uh, with the social protest. Um, but I've been asked to just to concentrate a little bit on looking at what are the international recommendations that we can make to uh, particularly to Ireland and to other um, governments in relation to the UN Security Council. Now Maria has talked about conflict, sexual and gender-based violence, and the importance of understanding this in the social and cultural context of the crime. And that in addition to patriarchal systems based on domination and gender discrimination, other factors such as social, political and economic marginalization play a part in this crime. And for indigenous and Afro-Columbian women, these factors combine with historical attitudes linked to slavery and racial discrimination. 
If left in impunity, they will act to reinforce rather than challenge these pre-existing norms and patterns, which is why Maria's point on the need for a macro case on conflict-related se sexual violence at the national level is so important. And Ireland can help with this. The informal expert group on women, peace and security, which Ireland chairs, examined at the Security Council, examined Colombia last year in July and recommended that the Security Council members and others support women's civil society organizations in getting a macro case opened on conflict related sexual violence within the special jurisdiction for peace. And this is a request that women's organizations are still making. So Ireland could support the women's organizations working on this issue by requesting the informal expert group to hold a session on Colombia this year in order to follow up on their recommendations from last July. And as we have heard, Colombian civil society continues to suffer human rights violations. We're seeing this in, in the current situation with the police using excessive use of force against uh, to repress the social protesters, uh, a protest which started on the 28th of April and spread across the urban areas of Colombia and has left, well, numbers are quite difficult to, to be sure of, but somewhere between 30 and 50 protesters dead and one um, police officer and many more injured. However, the rural areas in Colombia are also suffering appalling violence due to the activities of illegal armed neo-paramilitary ELN and FARC dissident groups, which have resulted in forced displacements of over 11,000 people in the first two months of this year. And the Ombudsman's Office reported 182 defenders killed last year, and the killings of former combatants continue. These armed groups are a major obstacle to the implementation of the peace accord. And the UN Security Council has a mechanism which allows for the formation of a group or panel of experts to assist countries. Colombia is in need of a group of experts on organized crime that could advise the National Commission on Security Guarantees, an inclusive body established as part of the peace agreements and mandated to develop policies for the dismantling of the neo-paramilitary and other criminal groups. And most importantly, the prosecution of the intellectual authors behind these groups. A group of experts on organized crime appointed by the Security Council could greatly assist Colombia in this task. In the light of the recent protests and in order to address non-repetition, the HEP also issued a statement stating that there should be a reform on the security services and this is something that Pablo touched on in detail and where the international community in Ireland have experienced it could be useful to Colombia especially on issues to do with independent monitoring mechanisms. This is the fifth year of the, of the signing of the peace accord and the truth commission report is due out in, in November making this a key year for the peace process in Colombia. The autumn would therefore be a timely moment for Ireland to hold an event at the Security Council with Colombian women's organizations and Irish civil society organizations. Civil society organizations are facing attacks and, st and stigmatization as a result of presenting information to the transitional justice system, most recently on extrajudicial executions. The Truth Commission will implicate many powerful people in war crimes and crimes against humanity, which poses a risk for, the, for civil society organizations and the truth commissioners. It is therefore essential that Ireland and the international community promotes action on their, on their security situation. And if democracy is to be strengthened in Colombia, Ireland should put its weight behind promoting dialogue between the government and civil society organizations and strongly supporting the implementation of the peace accord agreements on civil society participation in policy development and decision making. Ireland has always been aware of the importance of civil society participation, of promoting human rights and protecting the lives of defenders. Right now, these three things are imperative in Colombia. Thank you, Catherine. 
Thank you so much, Louise. Thank you for those um, very, very constructive, very detailed, very practical. Uh, bueno. Um, so I'm going to once again invite people to um, ask a question. If you'd like to, you can either put it in the chat or, or feel free to um, turn on your mic, turn on your camera and ask the audience um, to ask the panelists. Um, and yeah, we have a question here from, from um, my TGI colleague, Bill Rolston. Um, the peace process in Ireland has been represented internationally, including in Colombia, as a model of how to do it. It was suggested here that Colombia has now also been represented as a model. In the Irish case, there is an element of hyperbole involved. Is that the same in Colombia? Uh, so it was um, sort of comparative perspectives on Northern Ireland and Colombia as model peace processes. If anyone would like to come in on that? Pablo? Uh, like it? Yeah, please, Pablo. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Bill. I think that uh, it's too early to tell whether the Colombian model is one that uh, deserves uh, to be fully praised uh, or not. Uh, there are certain things that one can say, of course. It is in, I can say this because I'm Colombian, in typical Colombian fashion, an extraordinarily complex, uh, it creates an extraordinarily complex uh, set of structures. And uh, uh, also in typical Colombian fashion, the design of those structures do not always bear a close relationship uh, with the capacity of institutions to actually deliver what they are supposed uh, to deliver. So one thing, uh, that in my mind uh, counts uh, against this becoming a paradigm is precisely its institutional complexity. It's institutional complexity that requires one of the things that is scarce uh, in uh, countries uh, like ours, generally countries uh, that are emerging from uh, conflict, and uh, countries that are, in many cases, where transitional justice is being attempted today, much more weakly institutionalized uh, than Colombia. And that object of scarcity is precisely the possibility of achieving institutional coordination. So the number of government agencies that require coordination in order to make this work is absolutely staggering. And this in a country which is not very well known for achieving institutional coordination. So there are many exemplary dimensions of the project, but I think that this is one of its big hurdles. And therefore it remains to be seen whether it should be considered paradigmatic uh, or not. It goes without saying that uh, uh, I, of course, think uh, that at this point, the best thing that can happen is for the full implementation and for the successful operation of the institutions. But I don't think that anyone should uh, deny the degree of complexity of uh, the model that has been established in Colombia. So. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. And thank you, Bill, for the question. We have a question for Lee and Laura. Um, and this is from Laura Knopfel. Thank you very much for your thoughtful presentations. My question goes to Laura and Lee. Could you tell us a bit more about the relationship between the Truth Commission and the HEP regarding business actors that voluntarily registered with the HEP, in particular, uh, I'm interested in how the right against self-incrimination is guaranteed. Hey. Hi, Laura. It's very nice to see you um, again, and thank you for the question. Um, well, in terms of, since the system is, is thought of uh, in terms of an integral system that really, and all the bodies relate to each other, uh, what happens is that everything uh, that takes place and all the truth, judicial truth that comes out in the, in the HEP, will move to the Truth Commission and the Truth Commission, although it has 
um, is now focused, they're now focused on, on drafting the report. They will receive information from the HIP until the last day. So everything, all the, the hearings where uh, business actors are participating uh, will be sent to the Truth Commission and that will be included in the report. Um, and in terms of the second question about self-incrimination, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm not sure if I understand, I will answer um, the way I, I see it. Um, so in, in, in this Truth Commission, one of the rules or the incentives for business people to participate is that a, the, whatever they say in the, in the Truth Commission cannot be taken to the, to the courts. So uh, that was one of the incentives that was uh, included in the design so that the business people would come. Of course, that is one of the great issues and it's been very hard uh, to uh, convey the message that it will not end up in legal uh, measures just because the Truth Commission, as you all know, has a mandate um, very much focused also on reconciliation and peaceful coexistence. So uh, not only thinking about the retributive uh, part of the equation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, Lee, would you like to add anything on that? I'll add just a bit uh, to what Laura just said, and I also wanted to address Bill's question, if that's possible, <laughs> in terms of and generally what happens with truth commissions, and I'm sure this will be the case in, in, uh, in, in the Colombian one, is that the testimony that you make in a truth commission cannot be used um, as evidence in a criminal trial, so that you that you can't self-incriminate in through the Truth Commission. It would have to be a separate investigation for those criminal trials. Um, but in terms of, uh, of, of Bill's question, I think um, one of the impressive things about um, the Colombian transitional justice process is how much research was done on every single transitional justice process that went before it. And, and that is, and then there's this sort of, tweaking and improvements and learning from those processes is what I make it the kind of comprehensive model that Pablo um, presented in his introductory comments and why we were saying it looks very promising, uh, the Truth Commission in terms of addressing economic um, actors involvement in, gr in gross violations of human rights. The problem is the veto players and the context. I mean, it's it, those kinds of, that you can have a beautiful model, but the implementation of it is going to depend so much on how to overcome these hurdles of uh, a very uh, politically, uh, uh, political situation that is not pro-human rights and pro-investigation into economic crimes and some of the other crimes, as well as uh, the problem of, as we've talked about the uh, COVID and other, context and the power of, of um, and many of these actors who have little incentive now to go forward. So the model hasn't played out in exactly the way we would have hoped. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we are um, arriving just at the, the, the wrap of the event. So just uh, we have had a couple of questions come in that are on related themes. So I'm going to share these questions and invite panelists to respond and also invite you to make any final concluding comments before before we conclude so um both are about really about the the upcoming um truth commission report um uh, according to your um, from my colleague lena maligan uh, according to your experiences what do you recommend to civil society organizations and international actors for supporting uh, the truth commission report um and from viviana jimenez uh, do you see any potential for the truth commission's report to uh decrease uh, the current ideological division in the country. So any comment on, on either of those important questions? I volunteer to make a couple of comments, in part because I am very keen and have always been very keen on the importance of uh, civil society in transitional justice uh, processes. Uh, I, I'm very fond of saying that I cannot think of the Argentinian transition without uh, the role 
of sales. I cannot think of the Chilean transition without the role of the Vicaria de la Solidaridad. Impossible to think about the Eastern European transitions without solidarity. Impossible to think about uh, the Tunisian transition without uh, civil society organizations, including uh, trade unions. So I think that, that we tend to forget uh, the crucial role uh, that they play. Now, what they can do is what uh, civil society organizations are usually very good uh, at doing, which is to take uh, the report and run with it and use it and disseminate it and make it the basis uh, of uh, the work. I think that this is uh, absolutely crucial. Part of the role of a Truth Commission report. Uh, no one can think that, uh, for example, Peru absorbed uh, the contents of 13 volumes uh, of its uh, report. But part of the role of a report is the socialization of truth. That uh, It's not uh, always the case that it discloses entirely new things. The important thing is that what it uh, contains is uh, socialized and internalized. And that relates to the question about, uh, to the second question about uh, the potential of Truth Commission for bridging ideological divides. I think that there is such a potential, but that this is uh, a process that once again is a bit more difficult, more fraught, less linear, and more time consuming than one thinks. I don't think anyone should uh, fool himself or herself in thinking truth on its own immediately reconciles. However, I think that the socialization of truth does have uh, the potential and constitutes the ground on which uh, social reconciliation can truly take place. But that means it happens because it spares changes at the institutional level, at the cultural level, and at the personal level. And none of those are easy or automatic, but without the truth, none of them will take place either. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pablo. Please go ahead, Maria. You allow me? I think that these questions are extremely interesting and uh, civil society has a responsibility. First, uh, something that has to do with uh, the Truth Commission. In its report, it ha they have to make sure that the progress made hasn't go back, doesn't have to go backwards because what the commission leaves for women, for example, sh we should make sure there is no backlash because there, is, there are commitments with other women around the world saying that we managed to do, th do this and we went forward um, uh, in the right of women of telling what happened to them. And the second area where we can support is in uh, peace education. We need to, take uh, to rural areas the importance of peace and how all these tools help reconciliation. And we're very positive. We do believe that uh, the, our society needs uh, help to understand why the conflict took place, why we still have uh, conflict um, we still have conflict now. So we need to send all our comments so that also the report uh, reaches children throughout the country and they can start changing the way they interact and we all interact in our country. So I think it's a, an essential and very powerful uh, tool. And if it's uh, used correctly, it will have a huge impact. I would like to ask the international community to uh, do the follow-up and uh, to look at recommendations, what leaves, what's left behind, but also uh, follow-up of the recommendations and the whole society has to be represented and engaged. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. I think that that's a, a fitting contribution on which to uh, conclude our um, 
conclude contributions from panelists. So, so thank you so much. Um, just before we do finally wrap up, I would like to note the um, comment from uh, Patricia Cortez, the Colombia ambassador to Ireland, who uh, wants to reiterate the Colombia government's commitment to implementing the, the peace agreement uh, with the understanding that this process will take at least 15 years. Um, as we've seen in Ireland, after 23 years, a daily um, peace is a daily commitment and work. Um, so thank you so much for joining the discussion, um, Ambassador. Um, it falls to me really just to, to thank our contributors so much. Um, the discussion has been, I think, hugely rich and important um, and, and, and certainly timely. Um, as many of the contributors have brought out, um, this is a, a fragile time in Colombia, um, which of course makes this discussion all the more important. Um, the um, comments that were made by several contributors about the, the challenges of transitional justice, um, Pablo's useful and sober warning, uh, they're always, they take longer, they're more expensive and harder than we can anticipate. And I have to say today, uh, a day after we had a very significant um, judgment from our coroner's court just yesterday um, on killings that happened 50 years ago, um, certainly here in Belfast, we can relate um, to that admonition. Um, a clear theme from the uh, contributions has been on the important role of civil society and the potential of the international community uh, to support that role. Um, in ensuring uh, ongoing commitment to human rights uh, throughout the peace agreement implementation, uh, accountability for international crimes, um, and the role that we can play in amplifying those demands of civil society. Um, and a clear theme also about the complex role of the state um, in all of these initiatives. Um, the Colombian state is, of course, the guarantor of the peace agreement, um, but also faces um, challenging questions of accountability. Um, and um, given the given that the UN Security Council um, is in many ways acting through the Colombian state and many of its interventions. Um, I think the contributions today give a clear sense of the priorities that will hopefully be informing the Security Council and indeed Ireland's tenure um, uh, for the next, uh, the next two years. Um, so with that, I want to thank again our wonderful contributors. Thank you so much for, uh, to all our um, audience members uh, who have um, diligently remained uh, as we went slightly over time. Um, and contributed through comments and, and your attention. We will be in touch with recordings of the events. Um, please feel free to circulate those and to disseminate them um, and to, to keep in touch. Okay, so um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and take care. Thank you all. Thank you.